This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today, we have the one and only Mr. Ryan Deeds with us. What's going on, Ryan? Oh, it's just a wonderful morning, my man. It's a good way to start the week, hanging out with you. There we go. There we go. Found out going back and forth with Ryan on LinkedIn that he has roots to Brandon, Florida at one point in his life. Hmm. Not that far from, from where we're at, Kyle, where the office yeah, is here. Yeah, that's interesting. What was you, you're from there or what? Yeah, actually, I had a house in Brandon, man. I mean, I know Valrico backwards and forwards. When I worked at Lanier Upshaw, uh, I was running IT there for 10 years. They were an insurance agency, about 7 to $14 million in revenue out of Lakeland. And so mm-hmm. I came up from Tropicana. I was doing uh, sysadmin work at Tropicana early on in my career and came to um, – uh, linear upshot from there and so yeah. we were in brandon we ended up buying a house in lakeland sold the house and actually uh, sold the house in brandon it was like 2004 2005 then we got jacked with the house in lakeland and i couldn't offload that until last year and so oh wow really yeah but i was there for 10 years you know and then went to Crichton up in nashville for five before moving on to assurex and so doing data working with producers you know um all that jazz Cool. What were you doing? What were you doing at AssureX? So AssureX, I mean, my main job at AssureX was to create kind of a data strategy for them. You know, so during my career, I've done uh, just an inordinate amount of insurance agency data and analytics for insurance agencies. Right? Typically, we're talking mid market in that ten million in revenue to sixty million in revenue kind of space. Um, just extraction of data from agency management systems and then trying determining what value looks like in data, which I think is just a nebulous offering. You know, it's a bunch of garbage. So much of it's trash, I think, now where I've come to. But um, with AssureX, my thing was, how do we create a data strategy? We have 50, 60 agencies of trust. Um, all of them want to do stuff with data. Where do we start? How do we do that? And so I built a data platform for them that held about $30 billion of annualized premium through invoices, through for, systems we'd extract that we'd give them back a dashboard that i built for them out of power bi and that was a stack that we used so i'd I'd use that as a uh, client facing utility for agencies doing claims management um for crichton specifically built a really nice dashboard for their clients so i had a lot of the skill set coming over to ag so when i came to assurex i was just like okay let's start you know if the agencies all want to give data let's start with invoicing because that's the cleanest set of data you have and we were able to get a lot of a lot of cool stuff done out of that and you know now that project is continuing on so you know one of the things i've learned the more that i talk to people who are a lot smarter than me is that even if you think your agency data is clean it probably isn't <laughs> um man, i had a long conversation you know chris paradiso is a friend of mine mm-hmm. and uh-huh. spent a good bit of time talking to chris specifically about uh donna and some of the things that they're doing with that product and i actually had a call with ron schroyer about that a couple weeks ago just to think about how I could integrate that with my agency. And, you know, the first thing they said was your data has to be absolutely pristine. I can tell you it's not, you know, I I know that up front. Um, And that can't be, I mean, from my perspective, from the agency side, it's just not realistic. You know, I mean, and and I always want to drive back on people and say, what do you mean when you say my data has to be X? Because to be honest, no one, I mean, 
is your agency holding limits and exposures in the agency management system? Is your estimated revenue up to stuff? I mean, there's like five questions I can ask to be able to determine kind of where you are in data maturity. I mean, you're not going to take an agency that's had to focus on scaling, selling um, these other things and then make them awesome at data overnight. I came yeah. into Crichton with a five-year freaking plan. It took me five years to get where I wanted to get with Crichton. And I mean, literally, like it was two years of data normalization how do we discuss it because if you go into an agency today it, how do they recognize revenue how do they call it and so you know I, I think that way more importantly is what do you want to use that shit for and how do you drive results with it um you know because maybe it's only three data elements that you really care about and what are those and how do we make those drive behaviors as we go forward i mean that's that's what i care about i don't you know it's way more about what data is important <laughs> that's that's my sole focus now so what data do you think is important? That's the million dollar question. Well, I mean, I think for me, if, if I was going to go into an agency, I would need two numbers to determine kind of a lot about an agency, right? And that's average account size and number of accounts. So though, based on those two metrics right there, I can really with just average account size, I can pretty much tell you very, very just specifically about your agency just with that one metric. So, you know, if, if that's in general, that's a pretty easy number to get to, um, you know, and so that's that's a key obviously growth is a huge one but growth is massively complicated because growth is not what we generally would think it would be there are five different elements to growth in an agency and they're hard to distill out from the data and so um i think insurance data is so interesting because your revenues can increase but you can be losing clients on the back end not seeing that also, your client count can increase and your revenue can decrease, which means operationally you have to get more efficient and be constantly looking for that. And so there's a there's a confluence of numbers that you got to look through. But, you know, I, I think for me, I like to know growth. I like to know net profit, I like to know EBITDA. Um, but if I'm just talking to somebody, average account size is the first one for producers, too. Because a producer tells me average account size $7,000. Hey, and what was it last year? $6,500. Yeah, you're doing it right. You know, you're moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there now that are the data conversation in the industry is interesting. I've got everybody from agents that are literally getting ready to be 70 or maybe 70 that probably still operate out of filing cabinets and may or may not have an AMS to having friends like Seth Zaremba, which is like a freaking software Jedi with what he's trying to pull off with, you know, neon. And, I, you know, I think that a lot of agents hear the buzzword, hear the buzzword. And, and they just, they don't even know where to start. You know, if you were going into advise an agency today that's really not put any emphasis on, on data in their agency, how do they even start to audit that to clean it up? Well, first, there has to be some pain to make it worth it. If you're, if you're a seven-person agency, then the last thing I'm going to tell you is go get a data management strategy, you know? If you're dealing with PL and you haven't, I mean, because operationally, you know, if I talk to you as an agency and you can't define what your perfect client looks like, we got a lot more problems than, than, than data, sure. <laughs> yeah. you know? And so I, I, there's so many more operationally efficient things to deal with. Now, it, I will always say you got to niche out, you know, you got to figure out w what niches matter to you and what you can't act on. You're not going to win being a general agent because general agents are going to be convenient to speed because it's a value conversation. To me, it's always going to be driven back to the agent to say, what is the value you provide that segment of client you do business with? And, you know, with core personal lines, we have speed and convenience and small commercial. Oftentimes it's speed and convenience. And I have a hard time seeing agencies our, you know, in, in our space and our size being able to deliver speed and convenient better long term than other larger capital intensive organizations. So I'm always trying to help agencies figure out what can they be the best at? How can like high net worth, high net worth is a much better fit for a, a local agent because we can do some concierge service shit that nobody else can do. We know the wealth advisors, we can we can put all this together. But you got to sit down and strategically think about, all right, over the next two years, man, what do we what kind of business do we want? What kind of agency do we want to be? And sometimes it takes discipline to turn down sales. And, and a lot of times you don't have you, you don't have the capital or the ability to be able to do that. Right. As you're as a, as you're trying to just grow your agency. Yeah. So is that know, who you're I working with? It's just agencies that are looking to grow. I mean, you know, I do consulting for all kinds of agencies, man. And, 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 and uh, you know, 
So oftentimes the question is this, how do I get technology to be more impactful in my agency? I don't care who you are. I've heard that question a million times. And so then it ties back to what is your perpetuation uh, strategy? Because if you're a 60 year old person waiting for the highest multiple ever um, on exit, you're not going to reinvest the amount you need to, to make that technology effective over the next five years. So sit, sit on your stuff, wait till you exit and get out. Don't frustrate yourself trying to be something that you're not, you know, now if you're willing to go ahead and spend some money, um, take a hit on the multiple to be able to drive that growth forward, then I think it's a, it's a much different conversation. You know, um, and if you're there, then I think it's basic stuff, Dave, as you talked about, you know, what, where do you start with this, this thing? First question I'm always going to ask is, do you have MPS? Do you, do you have a data marker for your current clients? Cause if you don't, don't worry about anything else. Cause if you can't retain those bastards then what are you going to do? You know? Yeah. And so I think that there's as, but that's my big play, right? Is come in, help un people understand kind of where they are today from the whole technological stack. And I mean, Steve and I are, are good friends. And so we've done this before multiple times, right? You go in and kind of help an agency understand where they're at and then what's that next step for them. Um, and what makes sense? Like I'll turn down, I'll turn down consultations because they're like, come and put data in for us. I'm like, yeah, man, it's not going to do you any good. Cause you don't, you're not there yet. You know, let's work on this foundational stuff and come back and talk to me in six months and we can do that, you know? And so, but I mean, that's, that's where I would, I would always start with customer experience. You know, uh, where are we short on there? I mean, you'll know when data is a problem. Data is a problem when you're starting to, your clients are asking for things you can't deliver is generally where that starts. You know, you're, like you're where's my renewal. I mean, well, okay. More than that. How does my renewal compare to other renewal? Now we're not talking small commercial, but if we go up mid market commercial at all, now what we're seeing when you bring that renewal out is, well, how do we compare to others in our field? Where are our claims comparative to those that are demographically similar? And that's the, I call that a capabilities gap, right? If I'm a small 12 person agent, how do I freaking do that effectively versus uh, Will on, uh, one of these big boys, Aon, Willis, somebody like that, that's just putting that stuff out left and right. I mean, but I think that's understanding what your client, your current clients want and need. That's the most important thing and helping to find that strategically, not just having it happen. Cause I think so often it just happens and then we don't step back and kind of think about it. Well, you, you know, you bring up an interesting point, too. And I mean, that's part of the vision that I have is we scale here at Florida Risk. You know, right now we're limited to being able to provide a little bit of a snapshot of where one of these service contractors, because our book is heavy in service contractors. So where do I compare to other, you know, plumbing and HVAC companies or plumbing HVAC electricians or whatever? And so we have to go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics to try and find out a way to benchmark, whereas I'd really like to be able to come back and, you know, when our book is big enough that we can we can provide good statistics and say, here's how you benchmark against our book. You know, my end game is I don't want to have to use carriers if, at some point. I want to have captives that we have set up with fronting paper and we're managing our own programs. But you have to have an inordinate amount of data to pull that off successfully, not just from the, the benchmarking standpoint, but from the prospecting standpoint. Because now it's a very serious monetary discussion of determining who it is you're even going to let to come into your program because you let the wrong person in, it's going to yeah. blow up. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly correct. I mean, I think that that's the, the, the challenge of it. But you are thinking through that stuff. So, you know, at least you're, yeah, you know, so it, it, it's always, it's a good problem to have when you can see out and say, okay, I know we're heading in this direction. We don't have the scale for it. How do we fix that? You know, how do we, how do we, do we partner with somebody? Do we go into like, a, like the neon deal? I mean, you know, I think that do we join a keystone aggregator that's going to help us with, I mean, there, there's a lot of different options today. And I don't think we're too far away from seeing some of these independents come together in very small ways um, and help each other out. I'm seeing it at AssureX all the time. We've seen three partnerships now that were non-traditional partnerships come out of AG. So I don't know if you, so our CMD is about a $50 million insure, uh, agency out of, um, uh, like Baltimore, and they joined forces with Oswald and created a, a separate entity because each one of their data in Oswald's freaking 90 million in revenue, you know? So you, these guys are having problems with their data from the standpoint of not having enough to be able to create these benchmarks. Assurex is actually creating some benchmarks, but when you think about what client, what you could deliver, like just like you said, if you had that on an iPad where you could bring that out to the plumber to say, here's where you guys are, here's what we expect, 
now you're sold. It, you, you won the account, right? It, it's not about golf or the relationship. It's about your ability to un explain why they're buying what they're buying. And I think that's where most of the large agencies are driving to. And when I talk about a capabilities gap, that's what I see. Their ability to de deliver that across a, a wide, wide area and, and the smaller agents just can't. It's so freaking hard to do. Yeah, I think that we've done a good job as much as the in insurance industry could do a good job of adopting CRM or starting to adopt CRM and being able to get the analytics and the data behind the sales and the marketing process. And we can make intelligent decisions on how we're going to invest in different campaigns and the ROI and the content strategies and all the other things that we measure inside a HubSpot, including lead scoring and all of that. I still think that there's a lot of agencies out there that haven't come to the realization that they need to be able to get that pre-sale data and be able to look at their behaviors and oh, monitor yeah. that stuff. I mean, we're, we're trying to run agencies out of agency management systems. And my theory has always been, we're not an agency until we actually sell an insurance product. Until that happens, we're a sales organization and sales organizations operate inside of CRMs, not Hawksoft, right? And that's not me throwing off on Hawksoft. Sure. We have a good relationship with them and that product meets a need inside my agency but i think that they would also be very <laughs> upfront about the fact that if i was going to run my automated sales and marketing and servicing efforts out out of hawksoft and try and, and replicate what i've got in hubspot i would fail absolutely miserably yeah. at doing that and that's the arms race that we're in right now from my perspective whoever the first one is that can come up with that product that will marry the operational data that you get from a crm to the sales and marketing related data i'm sorry the the operational data from an ams and the sales and marketing data that you would get from a CRM so that you can see everything from, you know, cradle to grave, we're not there yet. And I think people are trying to do it with Salesforce integration with Epic. I know that, you know, there's agency management systems that are trying to be CRMs and CRMs that are trying to be agency management systems. I don't know, man. I just, I feel like we put a Why do you think that is? Like, so why do you? We yeah, we yeah. haven't solved that problem yet. Right. Like what, what's your theory behind that? What, I mean, I'm interested to see your take, but both of you really, um, I mean, the problem, the problem is, I mean, so when you back in the day, right, you, you, you had one thing, you had your agency management software, right? Mm -hmm. You may have had an act or, or some kind of side piece that you was really arduous to use. And so a lot of times the, the AMS just said, okay, well, we'll put some kind of weird prospecting system on this. Right. And I don't yeah. really want them to. I, I am a, look, mediocre tools are wide, right? If you design a tool that does all kinds of shit, that means it does all kinds of shit very marginally. Sure. I would way rather you be hyper-focused on one or two things. And, um, you know, nowadays it's really about the agency that can creatively put together these services to, to scale this technology. And when I say scale technology, I mean something very specific. It's scaling the humanness of us effectively outward you know, leveraging technology to do that, right? It's it's how do we create a human-like experience to outward so we can pull those in to connect them with a human more rapidly. I mean, that's, to me, that is what technology should be leveraged for, right? Not the whiz-banginess, but hey, I'm a human, I'm trying to help you, I'm notifying you of some news and I'm gonna be here for you instantly with where, however and wherever you wanna connect. That's the use case for tech, right? In my, in my head, for the most part, case with insurance agencies is how we should be leveraging that is invest in things that shortens the cycle to get that person looking for an expert to an expert. Um, but yeah, that's why I think it came from, I mean, just these guys were looking at ways to make it easier on the agencies. So they plug in some mediocre software. And I also think agencies are not culpable. I mean, you will never hear an agency say, why did you fail at that software? Oh, I failed because I did not have the right culture and that you never hear that. It's always a software's problem. Oh, and, 100%. 100% yeah. of the time. Yeah. I say that too. I mean, it, it, even around processes in the agency, you, you can take a process that's proven time and time and time again. It's never the process. It's always the person and their failure to execute on that process. You're not getting enough, you're not getting enough appointments. Great. You're not executing on the phones. It's not the fact that the phone is an inanimate object. It, they that's didn't. Correct. It, they connected you. You didn't get it done when you were on it. I mean, but, but, that's but I mean, that's the crazy. That's the crazy way people think. Yeah. But what is? But the no, the it is. Cause, and it seems like more and more. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. Because it's shiny ball syndrome. Because we have so much shit flying at us all the time now. I mean, golly, when I'm running, like at a Surex, I would get 20 or 30 calls a month from agency CIOs saying, hey, did you look at this product? Hey, have you seen that product? Because you're just getting inundated with this and you don't want to miss the one thing that's going to make you competitive. What we forget is it ain't about that product. It's about the way you execute on that product. And that means that it's the way that you train your agency, the way that you bring expertise, how long... Because once you create a cycle of shiny ball syndrome, that means every time you try to implement new technology. So I find something cool, I bring it into my agency, I say, yes, go forth and use it, account managers. Account managers use it for a year, but we don't net the results. Now I say, ah, screw it, let's get rid of it. Because we never put the focus in on it. Now it's now I'm looking at that technology, that's that vendor's fault. I'm gonna go get a new tool from that vendor over there. It's gonna be the same freaking result. Well, the third time you do it, the account manager's like, screw y'all, I'm not doing that shit again. Right. Yeah, so they're going to go look for another job. They right. they just they're just not going to follow the processes. And then the next insure tech that comes in is going to say, "Oh, you have dumbass account managers that don't follow process." That is exactly what happens, and it drives me crazy because these account managers are awesome for the most part if they're given if they are given the support that they need. If there's not a cultural divide between production and servicer, and if the servicers are given the training and a constant constant training that they need to keep current with this shit. You know, somebody who says, I, my, my agency management system sucks, I would say your training sucks. That's exactly what I would say. Because you know the tool. Go learn how to use the hammer better than the guy down the street. Invest in the technology. Invest in the time. It ain't going to do it itself. And so as an implementer of technology, that is my biggest pain point, is just having individuals not understand that dynamic, that training is not a one-time thing. You're not going to bring in software, sit somebody down, say, use this tool, train for five hours, walk away from it. Now it's implemented. Just never happens. And so, well, that's the problem. They're all looking for the magic bullet. I see it yeah. every day. People, people want to know how you go out and produce middle market business. Well, I can tell you how I go out and produce middle market business. I'll tell you for free. I'll stand up and, and give an hour lecture on it. And I know that 99.9% .9 of you aren't willing to do what it takes to go out and produce middle market business in the technology piece is no different you've said the word investment no less than two dozen times since we've been talking people in the insurance world in my opinion by and large i'm not saying everybody because there's plenty of people out there that are champions for technology but they are a minority they're not viewing technology as an investment they infuse it in, they, they look at it as an expense, expense. line on their financial statements and they don't realize that the difference is that if you take the time and energy to invest to truly invest and sell out to your investment you will get a return on that i'm not going to get a return on my electric bill well and you, and i mean it's it's a tricky proposition but i do think that larger agencies look at technology as an investment i also think that they understand that technology is a small portion of the problem it's the implementation, the adoption, the continued feedback loop, the operational overhead it takes to make that thing a part of their everyday lives. Um, and I mean, they fail at it regularly. You know, I think all of us do and we all learn from it. But that, I just, I, I like to see things. If you have a CRM that works, that is awesome. If somebody's coming to me and says, hey, I want to put a CRM in, I'm like, hey, go spend three months with Excel. Get your producers to use Excel. And if they can't get them to use Excel, then what the fuck is the point? Like, I mean, yeah. you know. You're not going to get them to use a CRM if they can't use Excel. Well, right. then at least from the Excel experiment, experiment, I can come back and say, okay, the value that my CR my producers are looking for out of a CRM or X, Y, and Z, I have the culture to be able to do it. They use this simple tool. Now we have a needs analysis. I can go and I can go look at the CRMs to see which one fulfills my needs the best instead of starting. Because what happens is they say, hey, we need a CRM. They go buy a CRM. They put it in place. Now they learn the CRM at the same time that they're learning how to leverage a CRM. And they get all confused. Is it the CRM's fault? Is it my process fault? Where is the breakdown? Where is the breakdown? And all you really need to do is start with a free Google sheet and say, put your shit in here. You know, let's start here. You know, it's funny, man, because that's exactly how I started. I literally started with my prospect list in an Excel spreadsheet. I didn't even have an email program. I would do mail merges with Word, putting the text that I wanted in the address list from Excel to fire it out to people, to do all of my um, my direct mail pieces, my call list, everything from the exact same Excel spreadsheet. And I made that a habit, right? So once that became a habit, 
I realized that this is something that's important to me in my sales process. And that's the thing, because I didn't come from a background in this industry where I had a, a dad that had, it was a blue blood in the community that we oh, lived right. in that had a Rolodex that was three generations deep and could just hand me leads for friends and friends of friends, and I'd go out and close them. I had to figure out a way to do everything organically and I'm not going to tell anybody out there that it was the best way to do it but I can tell you this I'm still using an iteration of what I started developing 17 years ago today and I've just augmented that with technology okay. as I've been able to understand the technology how it would improve it and then I could afford it and it has worked for me you know and yeah. so now instead of me having to go out and go to a bunch of different websites to research prospects I can put their web domain into the company record of HubSpot and it's going to go out and scrape all of that same stuff off of the internet for me. That's why I spend uh, money every month to have HubSpot because otherwise it would be an hourly rate for somebody manually doing all this and I can take that same information and become much more revenue bearing in my activities quicker as a result of doing that. And I mean, I don't, I, I don't understand why that message is so hard to understand, but I mean, it also gives you a sense of appreciation if you start with Excel and you have a tool like that today. And I mean, this isn't me, you know, praising HubSpot for being the greatest in the world. They've got their own set of issues, but it works really well in our agency. And that's what I tell anybody that asks me, what CRM would you use? My answer is the one you understand and would use, not, mm -hmm. not you know, because you heard David say he has HubSpot, I need to go get that. If anybody's thinking that way, guess what? You're going to be sorely disappointed, A, in the fact that it does nothing out of the box, and B, you're <laughs> going to have to spend a lot of money to get it to do something when you're ready because it's got to be programmed. And chances are, as an agency principal, you're not qualified at programming a CRM. Well, I think it's also how it's positioned too. Like, you know, if a CRM's primary goal is to be big brother to the producers, you're always going to have a problem. If the primary goal of it is to pr save the producer time and provide competitive uh, advantage for sales, that's a different situation. And mm -hmm. so often, and oftentimes there's a maturation cycle where it's big brother until we learn to use it. And then it becomes advantageous year two or something. And so it's I I've I've probably put in eleven and built three CRMs myself just uh, in my career and I'm telling you the consistent thing behind what succeeds and fails is thinking through the incentives and the incentive. I've never seen it work if you don't pay producer if you don't not pay producers if it's in the system I mean really that's that's the truth if you know at Crichton if you didn't have it in the system and it closed you wouldn't get paid on it and so that happened twice and it never happened again <laughs> so, yeah that's a good move. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but I don't think, Kyle, you wouldn't say that it's a big brother environment here. It's probably actually no. too far to the other extreme. I probably need to be looking at more than what I look at. Yeah, I don't I don't think that at all. I think that, um, you know, you're a bit like like the corporate America type of situations. It's it's more like that. I mean, that's kind of how it was when I was at Coad. Like it was it was used more so as that big brother device um, you've got four in stage three and where's your call you know you you, you missed the opportunities in stage two and, and that's some yeah. of that stuff's important you know to focus on because you need to figure out where you're at in the sales cycle and where you're losing stuff or where you're winning stuff that that hit, stuff ratio. Is, you, hit ratio is the number you need right yeah that, that that's, that's of it. course important but you know i think that um a lot of these uh it, it, a lot of these organizations will use it the other way. And, and I think that's unfortunate because that's not what it's really for. Well, yeah. And I think that, you know, if you can, I think, again, it ties back to data. So for me, I like, I love to use, I, we built a tool for the producers where when they go out on a client call or a client meeting, they'd be able to bring up a map and hit a button. They could see all their prospects or clients on the map that were sitting around them. Right. And they love that because it was yeah. really easy for them to then multiply their time. You know, exactly. Hey, I'm going to go out there, look at this. I'll stop in at Bob's. I'll stop in at Joe's, say hi, and then drive on, you know? And so sure. I think anything that can be articulate, because the only thing we can do with producers is really save them time. I mean, in my head. And so uh, that's a validated producer that, you know, is putting on the numbers, you know? Um, Cause I don't know in your guys world, what's a new revenue for a producer in, in your guys size agency is, is what, what's a good number. What's a good number for them to produce for a year or per yeah. account? For, for a year, like for a year First, of new business. Well, I, we're a little bit of a unicorn in that I'm looking to hire people that have pretty good business-to-business -business experience. So 
I don't really expect my producers to come in and be able to handle something from beginning to end. I'm looking to buy in their Rolodex and I go in and help them close. So, you know, if I were to put them on their own, I think that if a producer hits between 50 and 75 in new business revenue in their first year, that's probably a reasonable expectation. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, yeah. I know from my time at BKS that the way our bonus structure worked, if I would, if, if I hit 150 K in new business, I got a bit of a bonus. And if I hit either two or 250, I hit even more. And then when my first review came, I found out that based on production, I was in the top 2% of producers in the country and I didn't. So that's, that's what framed my viewpoint. When I opened my agency, I lowered that number dramatically because yeah. I can't expect people to come out of here that have never been in the middle market, even even if they have a Rolodex, and, and go out and hammer 150 a year. I think that you know if you can get 150 by year three, meaning if you're if you can produce 150 organic in your third year, then you're doing good because you've got killing it. You're killing it. I mean, yeah, you most of most of the larger firms would be. Uh, 18 to 24 month validation started get between 40 and 60,000 salary, right? So, you know, you're talking $400,000 book of business, something like that, $300,000 book of business. Um, and, but yeah, man, I mean, you know, if you, if you find a person putting up 150, 175 in year three, they're doing awesome, right? I mean, that's a big ass book of business by year five, you know, you're talking $800,000 book of business, $900,000 book of business, which is significant. And so, well, we're pretty much staying between 25 and 50 in revenue per account though. So, I mean, it's not yeah. hard for them to scale. And that's the thing when you talk to agencies out there and they hear that, you know, you've scaled to a certain level or you've got a producer that, you know, sitting at a half million dollar book or whatever else, what they don't realize is the level of patience required as an agency principal to run your agency that way and the confidence that you have in your own processes and your own systems. Because when you're writing middle market, you could theoretically have a producer, if he brings in 200,000 in a year, that could be one account a quarter at 50,000 in revenue each. Well, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. agency owners by and large are not gonna sit idle for the other eight months out of the year wondering, what's going on. And I mean, I tell the story, we, we've got a guy here that had been on a dry patch, hadn't had an appointment or anything. And I, I hadn't, I don't monitor the CRM like big brother, but I just operate off a of feeling a lot. Like I know, and then that's horrible advice for anybody, by the way, <laughs> don't operate off a of feeling, but I just, I know when I'm not seeing emails come through, when I'm not seeing things on the calendar and all of that, I know that it's time for me to start digging. So I, I'm, I'm in my business enough to, to know when it's time to start digging. And I did, and he hadn't had an appointment in like six, eight weeks. And I picked up the phone on a, on a Friday afternoon and I said, look, man, I just, he, in, in the first thing out of his mouth, oh, I knew this call was coming. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't even know what I'm gonna say. I'm telling you to have a good weekend, take your wife out to dinner, relax. I know from looking in HubSpot now that you've done everything that I've asked you to do and you're just hitting a dry patch, man. It happens in the middle market and don't, don't stress over it. It's only going to make the problem worse. Just stick to your guns. I believe in you. I believe in the process. I know it's going to happen. And in fact, I bet you within two weeks, you're going to have a breakthrough. Just, I can tell from the activity because I know that the activity is going to breed results. And the only thing you have control over is the activity itself. Sure enough, not even two weeks later, he calls me. It's like the You're next week, believe this. man, or like a couple yeah, days later. Yeah, 50 grand in revenue, 40, 45, 50 grand in revenue. I, David, mm -hmm. you're not going to believe this. And I'm just sitting here saying, yep, I believe I it. Do. That's exactly yeah. what I told you was going to happen. And I mean, <clears throat> um, you know, I, th I think if I were to give agencies some advice that's looking to move into that middle market range, I mean, what first define what middle market means to you. You, you don't even half, half the people don't even know what it is they're actually going after. That's why I'm such a big believer in actually formalizing who your ideal prospect is. So period. You have, I agree with that. You 100%. have to do that. And, and, and if you do that, then you can stay in your lane. And, and it's really easy. Like if it's not your ideal prospect, don't waste any time on it. Only go well, after your ideal prospect. The problem and is so most for agencies us, don't have that, that discipline to be able to do that. Right. Most agencies are, Either they didn't come in with capital, they they, they so they got to take everything that they can, not understanding that as they do that, they're screwing their scale up long term. 
Yeah, especially mm -hmm. when you're dropping into the lower business, which is more service intensive and more transactional and, and requires less value. What what value can you yeah. provide to them? I mean, at least with your you know in your in your sales cycle, it sounds like you have a value proposition that you're able to deliver to that. As you work in that niche, you understand that business more. You can staff for it more. It's more efficient. It's more. I mean, there there's a win. It's a win across the board. And so yeah, I mean, I'm I, I think that's awesome. And I and I think you're right. I mean, if you can't define your target prospect or target client, you're kind of screwed. Well, and you're not going to know what the typical problems are that they face and how you can yeah. solve those problems and then build your value proposition around solving the problems. That's another thing I say all the time. I, I want to solve problems, not sell products. Right. And if I can go in and solve a business's problem, I'm going to have them as a client for the long term. So we do invest heavily in things like Think HR, where if somebody's got top loss drivers around manual material handling, boom, I have a learning management system at my disposal that I could immediately enroll all of their employees that ever lift anything for how to handle team lifts, proper lifting procedures, all of the things that will make them OSHA compliant and otherwise to ultimately make that business more profitable for them and for our carrier partners and ultimately us because we're going to bonus out on our loss ratio with our contingencies and everything. And I think you have to look at that stuff, man. I mean, I can't just walk into a middle market company and compete against Lanier Upshaw or some of these others and, and just say, hey, I'm David and I'm here to sell you insurance. <laughs> That's just not how it works. Well, and it's an 18-month sales cycle too for those. I mean, if you're talking 50000 in revenue, that kind of account – I mean, that is a 12 day, that, that's that, that, because you got to get that person to fire that other agent that they've have a relationship with. And that's mm -hmm. an important client to the agent most of the time. And so, you know, there's, a, you got to figure out what's the, what's the pain? How do we create that? How do we build trust that we can solve that? And then strike when the hot, fire is hot, so to speak, right? Like create that wedge and then go after it when you have the opportunity. And I just, you know, but if somebody's doing it right and they have that pipeline filled, like you said, and they have, they're doing those behaviors after 18 months of doing that, they should be able to close pretty consistently over time. Once that's filled up. Absolutely. And for those of you that just heard what Ryan said about the length of the sales cycle, now you understand why my absolute favorite time to engage with a piece of new business is a month after they renewed. That is the best time. If you want to take that sales cycle and make it from 18 months to nine, get in a month after renewal because guess what? That is still credible. They just went through their renewal. The loss runs are going to be reasonably accurate. They don't have to go to their existing agent to ask for those loss runs, so you're not sending up any red flags. And chances are, if they're willing to take a meeting with you a month after they renewed, that renewal didn't go very well, so you can still get to them while they're emotionally charged over what the renewal is. But more importantly, it gives me an opportunity to lay out a value proposition and make a, a calculated investment into them in terms of what resources we're willing to give them as an agency. And by the time the renewal comes up, it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to just let us handle that for them because we've, we've put the existing agent out on the street, you know, three months in after renewal because they were getting now the clients getting things they never had gotten before or didn't even realize were available to them and so you have to be able to be patient enough for the long play but strategic enough to know where you can pick up efficiencies in that process and guess what it's just like anything else you have to put yourself outside of your comfort zone in order to do that but i do know that if you are an agent and you ask for an appointment after a renewal and somebody says you know a month after renewal and somebody says yes you have a much higher likelihood of closing that account than than if you wait until the 60 or 90 days before renewal like everybody else well i think there's this like little tricky thing i've been messing around with a little bit like so what if you got a list of of prospects in your in your area right and you knew what their x dates were and they're not your clients. Maybe they were your old clients, whatever, right? They're, but the, anybody who's not my client in this area that I prospect in, can I send them three months after renewal, five months, you know, six? Can I send them an NPS score asking how they like to deal with their current insurance agent? Or are they getting the value out of that? Now, they're not my client, right? These are folks that are not my client. They fit my client profile. And so I'm prospecting to them. If they come back with a low NPS score, now I make that freaking call, right? Then I'm a third party just reaching out to say, hey, wanted to see if you're, how your relationship is doing with your insurance agent. Are you getting everything out, you know, out of that that you need to? They come back. I think that would be a brilliant way to be able to create kind of an active pipeline with individuals, right? Like a reverse NPS where you're sending it to your, uh, your, your, 
competitors' clients to make sure that everything's going okay. Well, I can't, I can't speak for anywhere else in the country, but that would be extremely easy in Florida based on the amount of data that you can mine from the FLDFS website. Yeah, you just send it you've to got X, you have X date, You have X-State carrier and agency that are all deep within the bowels of the FLDFS uh, workers' comp division. And, you know, if I have a competitor that we've hit two or three on, Guess what? Now I can go pull a leads list of everybody that's in their book of business. <clears throat> and, you know, we can create an email campaign to get that's NPS. Right. I mean, inside they of moved HubSpot, it around, you know, so we were talking about that a couple of weeks ago. They, they moved where that was located on there. I don't know if you went back in and, and I found it. Yeah. You can't hide from me. <laughs> But I mean, that's kind of a, I think that's, that's a, that's a kind of a, a little hacky, interesting concept to be able to reverse yeah. something that we would normally do, you know, that might give you a competitive advantage. Well, and then the other thing, if you want to look at it from the marketing side, at that point, you can create, you can take that person's, that, that competitors or list of competitors, uh, website addresses, and you can pop them into the parameters of a YouTube ad. And every time somebody goes to that that competitor's YouTube page to watch their content, your ad is the first thing that drops before right. they ever see, you know, I mean, there's so many different ways that, and again, people don't go out and try and do this yourself, hire a professional. I mean, I know about this stuff because I didn't really have a choice and I kind of like it. So it's more of a hobby and a passion for me, but I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do um, if you're just willing to invest and guess what? If you invest, you'll get a return on it. You just have to be consistent in your application and in your execution. Training and technology is part of the spend on tech. And then I would say that 30% of your technological spend should go back into training every year. You know, if you spend a hundred grand on tech, just plan to spend 30,000 on training because that's how you maximize your investment on the tech side. <laughs> So listen, man, you've got something new that you're dabbling in. I know that you want to keep it close to the vest, but I wanted you to talk a little better as much as you're comfortable to talk about Enable uh, to sort of get the word out for people who might be listening to this that uh, it could benefit. Yeah, man, it was cool. Like, so I was working with Asurex and I had, I had kept relationships open with Kabir. Kabir is the gentleman who had started a risk match, um, you know, a bunch of years ago, sold that off to Vertifor, and then he came back into the space and he's like, look, you know, we, we were chit-chatting. He says, you know, I, there's so much pain inside an agency today and it's getting worse because they're just getting crushed by software. Every agency has to have 12 different pieces of software in there today. And then then they lose time and access. They, you know, producer A forgets how to do this thing in this place. And, you know, so I, I want to solve for that is, is what he really said. And so I was like, okay, well, it sounds awesome, man, you know. And um, so we're building something that will connect to every system inside an agency and bring that into a consolidated view for for agents. Um, and it's right now we have we, we have a couple of clients that we're extracting data from. We're moving very quickly. Um, and I don't know, man. You know, from my perspective, you've got a team of people that are from insurance this is this is it's neat because you know we're all like agency people we're all agency nerds we all love independent agents we love the distribution channel and we believe that um you know there are a few companies out there that understand the implementation challenges they that have worked in agencies as much as we have that can really craft a solution to kind of help take care of all the problems that we've seen in other products that are out there um and so you know i i feel like It'll be a lot of it'll be a lot of information that, that we extract and then we're trying to provide wisdom in an easy way um, and in a very accessible way to agents, you know, looking to drive revenue, looking for opportunities, helping them prospect, augment data augmentation. You know, a lot of the stuff that you had kind of said, um, Dave, you know, where, hey, I take this website and I go plug it in to this other place and I get this data back. Those are those are some of the things that we've already started to work through, right, is, hey, we're going to take this client name, we're going to go hit this thing, we're going to get all this extra data, you're going to be able to access that when, so if you type in the client through enable, here's all the information, here's your email conversations, here's this, here's that, everything organized in a decent way. Um, trying to save time, bring that stuff together, limit the frustrations, and then help drive behaviors. Ultimately, we know that your these five activities close the most business for you. Here's the activities that drive the least amount of value for you. Focus here. Here's the here's where you need to go. Here's how you're going to grow that book. Here's the opportunities in your existing book. Here's the opportunities in your area, and here's competitive intelligence on that. Interesting. That's crazy. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I love it. I, I love it because you know it's it, I'm I'm, a, I'm I've always been like a bad builder. Like I can build almost anything. I can just clutch it together, but it always sucks, right? It's never scalable. <laughs> it, it 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 fixed my agency's problems, but I would just it would be band-aided and, and super glued and taped, you know. And so now I get to work with like these world class engineers where I'm like, hey, this is we we should think through this. And they like throw it together. I mean, they built an extractor for Epic within like three weeks. So literally the lab, the two clients, the, the clients that we've been working with right now, they drop this extractor in, it sucks the data out, and we already have access to it. And I mean, it it was just, and it's all like super secure, AWS based, like when you watch these guys build this stuff out. And so as a, as a person coming from insurance agencies, right, it's really cool to kind of see inside like the whole thing. I mean, I'm just like an insurance agency geek that's now looking inside this, this kind of magic arena of technology. And it's it's really badass, and the team's dedicated to to helping agencies kick ass and remain relevant going forward, and try to avoid some of the pitfalls of the technological solutions that have been uh, that that have happened before. I think the fact that you can put it in a user interface that's like a dashboard just makes it a win right out of the box. I mean, that's to me that's you you hit the nail on the head, man. I mean, you're one of probably a million at least that build systems by cobbling, you know, the, cobbling what they can together. And, you know, it may work and it may work as, as well as you need it to for the time. But I think all of us that have been down that road have hit a point at some time where we say, if I could build this any way that I wanted to, just from the ground up, what would that look like? And that sounds to me like what you're doing. And it's so cool because I've built dashboards my whole life. I mean, I can show you, like, dude, I've built agency-facing dashboards that were so badass. Like, the, my favorite system I ever built in my whole life was this thing for account managers where account managers would go in and they'd be able to dictate their process. So they'd be able to say, look, we have a renewal process. This is what it is. So I'd have three or four account managers go do that. They'd print the whole thing out. And they'd sit around. They'd come up with an agreement. They'd say, yes, this is our standardized process for mid-market habitation, right? Just very, very niched out. So they would take that process and then they'd have a template that they would apply new renewals to and they'd have a dashboard that they, because account managers never feel like they're winning, right? They never, they always feel like they're underwater. And so all I wanted to do was provide this checklist to say, this is what you have to do today. This is when it gets done, you're going to get a green mark right here. So when you get up out of that desk at five o'clock, you're going to feel like you did something awesome. Right. Because they always feel so beat up and I hate that for them. And so, you know, I get to take all these like badass experiences of building this very fast through my uh, through the outside. And really, they just been like, here's an engineering team. And obviously, it's the collaborative effort. You know, Kabir's in there, Christy Malm's in there, Anton. But we're all agency people that have deep agency experience that can really try to figure out like. And I mean, that's what we're here for. Kabir doesn't need the money, right? That dude's here because he believes in his soul about agencies. And so for him to have picked me to come over and like you said, it's it's like being a kid in the candy store, man, where I can say, I want that candy right there. I want you to mix that and that. It's going to be the perfect thing ever. And then they go and do it and they do it the right way with all the scale. Oh, man, it's so beautiful. But yeah, so that's, kind of, that's, that's the You fun. know what, man? You may have thought about this, but one thing that I would tell you just based off of what I heard was when that account manager has that really good day, you should have a message automatically fired over to whatever producer book that she's working on to tell them to reach out and congratulate them on having a good day or give them a pat on the back or whatever else because that's the other gripe that I have about agencies is the gap between production and service. Both think they're the most important people in the operation. That's not but, true. I don't agree with you. That's a, No. Owners come from production, so they elevate producers and they treat producers better. That That's why that happens. Yeah, so that, that doesn't exist in our firm. Well, that, that's least, true. We've it, combated that, right? So right. we one thing that we have that's completely different than most is everybody has a path to equity in our agency. I want everybody thinking like they're a business owner. I don't want any. I don't want my account managers feeling like you know that they're not valued because they're not the ones bringing the business in. And I don't want producers out there think overvaluing themselves because the account managers are the glue that keeps the business on the books in many cases. And so to me, that was the biggest. There's two problems I had to solve when I launched my agency, the number one thing is to get producers to believe in themselves enough to just trust and go out and do it. Self-belief is the number one enemy of any producer out there right now. It's not product knowledge. It's not lack.
lack of technology. It's you don't believe you can do it and you don't believe in yourself enough. So you need to fix that first. Then you can go out and be successful. And the other is that that gap that exists, that's allowed to exist, at least in the agencies, in my experience of production and account managers having a divide and it is just a cancer in any organization and i told myself those two things will never happen my producers will believe in themselves and i will back them up to make sure that they do and no one will ever be held at a higher higher level part of that probably has to do with the fact that my not very well-known minor in college was japanese um, and it comes from the flat style of management in japanese organizations where you know, there is no org chart or hierarchy. It's literally here's who's in charge and everybody else is on the same level. Now, the interesting story behind that is when I started college, uh, a lot of business was being done in Japan. And after my Tommy Boy experience of taking eight years of getting through, everything moved to China. So my minor was rendered worthless. But <laughs> other than anecdotally in podcasts in, in 2021. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that that's a, that's a huge issue, man. And, oh, um, it is. And, and, I mean, and it only goes away if ownership and leadership makes a concerted effort to do so. And so, yeah, I mean, that's like when I'm looking at culture in an agency that wants to do data management, if there's a large, if there's a shift between what the leaders think they see and what the the, the employees see, or if there's a cultural divide between those, the, you know, producers and servicers, don't do shit else until you fix that. Because everything you're going to you're gonna do is going to become undone by the drama that's created internally with that, with that dynamic. Dude, I have to ask the question because I've seen them flying across the screen multiple times. Do you have double enable tats on your forearms? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. People, I don't nice. know how you sell out any more than that right there. I there mean, that go. is a man that is guaranteed to succeed. Well, I mean, so this is funny. And, you know, I, I've never been an owner. I've asked to be an owner of agent, every agency I've ever worked for. I've come to a couple of them with agreements of beforehand and then things have changed. So now finally I get to be an owner. Come on down, man. Come on down. We got hey. room for FRP somewhere on you. I mean, I, I had ESOP. I had a couple of these different things, but I never had direct stock ownership. So now for the first time in my whole career, I have my effort is directly correlated to my long-term prosperity never happened before and i'll tell you it's for, it's for real <laughs> it's for real i i have uh all the ter determination work i just i cannot i we're, we're it's 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 badass it's super cool so yes i'm very very uh, in in the in the end of the day it's it's this is the vehicle that i believe will change my my existence and i i will change a bunch of agencies existence with it you know nice so all you agencies owners owners that are out there and you're stingy with your equity you don't want partners you don't want to work on your succession and perpetuation planning. I don't know that I've ever heard of anybody in the entire time we've been doing the podcast or my time in this industry that sounded more motivated than what Ryan Deed sounded right there. And it was 100% based off the fact he now feels like he's officially part of something and can have direct control over his future. I know you guys need to get off your wallets and figure it out because what you haven't realized is the fact that when you have a team of people that feel that way and they believe in a common mission, it's not going to be a matter of, you know, what percentage they own. It's going to be what multiple they take your business to and ultimately make you way more money than you're going to make under current operations. So listen, man, I, I'm going to wrap it up on that. That's a high That's note. Good. That was absolutely on the money i appreciate you taking time to yep. uh, come hang out with us today man and always inspiring to hear people who who just think completely differently than a lot of other people do and, and you've been under the hood of a lot of places so your you know your your opinion is very much respected and appreciated and i just thank you for taking time to spend with us I appreciate it, man. If I'm down in Valrico again, I'm going to track y'all down, man. I'm going to see what's anywhere up. close. Dude, anywhere right. close. I'll do it, man. Thank All you, right, brother. Take care, care, Ryan. Appreciate it. Bye, guys. Uh -huh. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.